Okay. Oh, that's that's loud. All right. Thanks everybody for coming back. Hope everybody had a snack and a coffee. And uh, we're gonna have our next talk, which is on Qualcomm Wi-Fi chips, exploitation, reverse engineering of them, and a demo. Right? You're telling me you're very excited for your demo. Okay. Cool. Well, give them a hand, everybody. Let's uh, get going. Okay, yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for the warm welcome. Um, yeah, just a disclaimer, opinions are my own and do not uh, represent the views of my employer. So um, why Qualcomm chips in the first place or Wi-Fi chips in the first place? In my opinion, Wi-Fi chips are pretty powerful, uh, powerful chips. Uh, everybody always thinks uh, Wi-Fi chips just do Wi-Fi, but of course they forget that these are general purpose computing devices and you can run anything on it. The problem is just that um, they uh, often use proprietary uh, software um, and it's not so easy to run your own code on them. Um, why would we even want to run our own code on Wi-Fi chips? Well, we could extend the existing functionality uh, with our own. So for example, you could uh, let your Wi-Fi chip uh, speak, uh, let him speak at Zigbee if you want, or you can even uh, try to uh, get access to lower layer um, features of Wi-Fi and even uh, implement uh, like software defined uh, radio similar to this uh, kind of features. Um, and, of course, it's also interesting to, for security research, in my opinion, because um, you only get so far with uh, st static analysis. Even if you get the firmware, you look at it, um, static analysis only gets you so far. And also the, the size of the, the code, which is running on, on these uh, Wi-Fi chips nowadays, is pretty big. And you really want to, to enable um, dynamic analysis to have a... Uh, to get a, a to make uh, finding bugs easier. Um, so if we look at the um, at, uh, more into the, the, the security side of things, um, Qualcomm had a um, pretty rough year 2021 for their um, Wi-Fi chips. So they, they needed to release a lot of um, uh, notifications about critical or high vulnerabilities. Um, they are basically the, um, maybe not the biggest, but one of the biggest uh, vendors of Wi-Fi chips. So if we see this high number of vulnerabilities which, which were released only in a single year, we m might wonder what other vulnerabilities are in there. And uh, I mean, ideally we would like to, to run like an open source firmware on, on our uh, Wi-Fi chips. But uh, maybe as a first step, we can um, try to uh, get a deeper look into the Wi-Fi chip and, and how it works. So in general, there are two types of Wi-Fi chips. The um, softmax, so the left side, is what you find, what you will find in your uh, notebook. So this is, uh, yeah, usually um, uh, using the, the driver uh, in your kernel to um, implement the Mac layer. On the other hand, there are full Mac chips, which uh, uh, the, where the Mac layer is implemented in the firmware. So um, if we want to, to change something on the Mac layer, we, we directly need to change the firmware instead of the driver. This handling the Mac layer in, in the firmware has the advantage that it's more power efficient, and therefore you will see uh, full Mac chips mostly in, in IoT and portable devices. So um, let's focus on, on full Mac chips for this talk. What previous work has there been? Um, back at uh, my time in the university, together with a colleague of mine, we developed the, the Nextmon framework. This uh, focused on Broadcom Wi-Fi chips. It uh, allows um, patching of the firmware of those Broadcom chips. And um, we even managed to develop uh, patches for, for um, stuff deep in the, the Wi-Fi subsystem. So um, we got access to channel state information, for example, which is pretty cool. So you can check it out at nextpond.org. 
There has also been some work at um, Intel-based chips at Black Hat 2022, and there was a talk at uh, DEF CON 27 and Black Hat 2019 about uh, hexagon-based Qualcomm Wi-Fi chips. But this work is the first work on uh, extensor-based Qualcomm Wi-Fi firmware. Some background on um, how a uh, Wi-Fi SOC looks, uh, looks internally. So usually you have your Wi-Fi core and it's always uh, bundled with an application core. And uh, they have some interconnect in between and, and talk with each other. And uh, sometimes you also have an uh, optional uh, real-time core. This might, uh, might or might not be the case for uh, the chip you look at. Um, this is uh, mostly used for uh, like time critical stuff like the distributed coordination function in Wi-Fi. So let's look at uh, Qualcomm a little bit more. So interestingly, there are uh, multiple kinds of uh, drivers and firmwares. So um, the official one is, or like the most official one probably, is the ADH10K from Qualcomm. Um, as I said, there is the ADH10K driver and alongside this, there's also a firmware for it. And then there is also ADH10K from uh, Candela Tech. So they also have their own driver and their own firmware. And uh, those guys bought the rights from um, Qualcomm a while back and implemented their own firmware and added additional features to it, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, and apart from this, there is also QCL CLD from Qualcomm, which is uh, used for factory processes. And uh, you can also uh, run the uh, Qualcomm firmware on the Candela Tech driver. So the chip I had a look at was the IPQ 4019. Um, I um, chose this uh, Habanero board from eight devices. This is basically uh, um, a development board for Wi-Fi enabled home routers. And what you see in the middle is, is, the, is uh, the IPQ 4019. And I also have it with me. And uh, later on, we will do a demo on it. So how does this chip look in particular? Um, it's, uh, first of all, it's used in uh, many uh, Wi-Fi home routers, I think. So there is a database which scrapes the, the FCC website and it uh, basically shows you how many uh, instances of this chip uh, has been found and which were audited by the FCC. And I think like over 70 uh, different um, routers and, and uh, Wi-Fi enabled devices are using this chip. Um, one popular brand in Germany is, is uh, AVM and uh, the Fritz box uh, is also one device by them which uses this, this uh, particular chip. It um, uses an ARM Cortex-A7 for the application core. This application core runs OpenWRT and uh, for the Wi-Fi uh, subsystem there are basically two cores, uh, one for 2.4 and one for 5 gigahertz and they use uh, PCI to communicate. So let's look at, uh, let's have a deeper look into the firmware which is running on these Wi-Fi cores. So this firmware is uh, extensor based, uh, little endian. It, extensor comes originally from Tensilica, but they were bought from uh, uh, Cadence at some point. Um, the firmware consists of a ROM part and a RAM part. The RAM part is basically a file in the uh, file system, uh, in the OpenWRT file system. It, uh, the file itself contains what they call segments, multiple ones, which we see in a second, and uh, some parts are L77 compressed. The ROM can be patched, which is also interesting, and there is this code swap mechanism where you can extend the memory of the Wi-Fi core into the host memory. Um, by default, there is, uh, of course, no security enabled. Why would it be? So no secure boot, no stack canaries, no address randomization. So um, what is there already which we can use for debugging? Um, the ADH10K driver comes with this debugfs file system, which is pretty neat. Um, you have uh, this memvalue file, which you can use to read and write memory directly into the, the chip, which is pretty cool. 
And there is also uh, a debug mask file which you can use to increase the verbosity of the, the driver. So which interfaces does the, the firmware have to the, the host device? So um, the first one is a bootloader messaging interface. Um, it's used to communicate during boot up and it's implemented in ROM. And then after the boot up is done, it uses the WMI, the wireless module interface to uh, send commands to the, to the um, Wi-Fi subsystem. So for example, if you want to start a Wi-Fi scan or do some general configura configuration. The loading of this firmware looks like this. Um, you have in general two possibilities. Either you use the, the uh, bootloader messaging interface or there's also a copy engine. But um, in our case, I looked at um, the Qualcomm firmware and this is a compressed firmware and therefore we need to use the BMI method. And um, what this does is it, um, it uh, gets the firmware from the, the file system and then via the driver, it, it, it gets loaded into the Wi-Fi core and only in the Wi-Fi core, it, it gets then um, uh, decompressed. This is how the, this file looks like. So um, in general, we have two big blocks. So here, the, 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 this first, um, what they call segment, and then the second segment. And um, at the beginning of this, there is some a kind of magic value which just identifies the, um, the segment on itself, a flag which tells, okay, this is uh, compressed, and then also an, an address where this should uh, get loaded, basically. And if you look closely, you will note that uh, this first address and the second address are, are the same, so those get overwritten, basically. Um, yeah, and also the, the length is, is different. And then uh, within these segments, there are multiple parts. And uh, the, the, uh, then they start always with the metadata and then the, the code itself. And only the code is, is compressed. And if we look at the, the driver logs, we will see that um, the first part is what they call OTP. I think that this is just um, so you can have other devices where this is really burned into uh, one time program programmable memory. Um, but here they decided to just uh, put this into the file itself. And the second part is actually then the, the Wi-Fi uh, firmware itself. And also this, this whole loading is, is done twice. Uh, I think this is done because of we have these two Wi-Fi cores and it just does the same process twice and then um, uh, the corresponding Wi-Fi cores just use the code they need. If we do, um, if we use this debugfs to do a whole, uh, uh, just sweep the, the whole memory and, and do a dump of that and look at the entropy, we will uh, see this um, repeating, um, um, yeah, like um, uh, uh, memory dump. And um, this is, um, I think, done for um, access rights. So basically, you uh, need to uh, access, um, for example, one part of the memory. If it's on one address, you cannot execute it, but if it's on another uh, offset, then you can execute it. It's a weird thing, but this is, I think, how it works. So how does the uh, extensor architecture uh, look like, which is uh, used in these Qualcomm-based chips? Um, I don't want to, to go through all the API, but Two uh, uh, interesting options are on this slide. So um, the first one is, uh, this was basically my, my major enemy of this whole uh, research. So they use literal pools. This means that, uh, I, I was not familiar with this concept, maybe uh, some of you are, I think it's also a feature which can be used in ARM, but I have only just seen it here for the first time. So this means basically that uh, your load instructions are independent of the program counter. Instead, they use a, um, basically an, an address to, to a literal pool, and then there is the starting point of this, which is called lit base. Um, I will explain this more in a second. And then there, they also use um, something for, for uh, if you want to call functions, the, they use the call8 ABI, 
and this uh, is basically using a, a window, uh, um, uh, a, a register window, and in case you call a function, for example, if this is a10 in the in the caller, it will be uh, a2 in the callee. This saves you um, the effort of uh, storing uh, uh, your register registers uh, when you want to do a call. So um, I talked about these literal pools. How does this look like? So um, if we imagine that this is our memory, um, and I have some some code which wants to to um, call this wlan main function, then um, this will be translated in a load and a call, and uh, this load instruction uh, then um, has an an offset of in within the literal pool encoded in itself. And then one can go ahead and look at the literal base and then uh, add the offset to it and then it, you, you can get the, the actual target address of the function you want to call. So this uh, lit base is, there is a special um, register for this in the um, extensor um, uh, 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 assembler. And this, this code here is basically set at the very beginning of the, the, the firmware uh, in the ROM part. And um, yeah, as you can see, they, they use the, the start address and then add the, the size of the whole pool. Um, this just means that the offsets which are actually encoded are, are negative and um, you're uh, always subtracting. So in the end, this means that the existing firmware code does expect to uh, that we use this lit base, um, and we will see that this is a problem later on. So, how does actually um, how does the uh, disassembler support look like for Extensa? Not so good. So, Ida 7.7 .7 added support for Extensa, but this this uh, lit base option is ignored. Same for Chydra, so there is a plugin for, for Chydra to, um, to um, decode extensa, but the lit base option is not supported. Same for uh, Radar 2 and Binary Ninja. So the only option we have is really to uh, patch uh, this in ourselves. Um, I did this for both Binary Ninja and uh, Chydra. So uh, what I came up with is just this real simple uh, patch which uh, instead of uh, using the uh, address of the program counter, you're just using this lit base and the encoded uh, immediate to calculate your, um, tar or your offset to your target address. And so this is how it looks like for Binary Ninja. And there's also a similar patch for Chidra. This, of course, is not a pretty nice patch uh, you would uh, want to uh, do this dynamically uh, when you uh, do the disassemblation and you come across this lit base um, assembler, you uh, need to uh, store this internally in, in your disassembler logic. And, uh, but this, I'm not a programmer. I, um, I, this is what I came up with. This works for me. Um, please feel free to uh, add to the corresponding plugins. Um, uh, I provide these these um, patches in the uh, code I, I release in the end. So um, I, as I said at the beginning, I wanted to to patch the uh, firmware, and for this I, I used the Nextmon framework, which I was already familiar with. Um, if we look at this Nextmon framework, it's uh, on the first look pretty complicated. So for uh, Broadcom-based chips. You can extract ROM code, what they call flash patches, the RAM, U code, um, what have you. And um, but you can write patches in C, and of course uh, compile and link the code and create a firmware file which a Broadcom Wi-Fi chip will understand. But if we want to reuse this, we can basically slim it down. And um, the um, basic parts we need is, in, a, in the first step, we need to um, compile our patches and what we call wrapper uh, into object files. Wrappers are just uh, stubs for functions which are already existing in the firmware. We, we use a, uh, the GCC and a, a custom compiler plugin to compile those. 
And with the compiler plugin, we, we get what, what is called nextmon.pre, which is basically a, um, a file which contains uh, additional data for where do our patched code actually needs to go into the binary. In the second step, we can uh, use this pre file to uh, create an, a linker script. And then we can uh, use this linker script together with the, the O files to create an ELF file. This is pretty neat because um, you can just use this ELF file and directly load it into a disassembler, and it already knows all the offsets and everything. And then there is also um, a um, definitions.mk file, which just defines some, um, some, some general variables, variables which we can reuse. For example, where uh, do we want to put our patch code in the firmware binary? and how much space do we have and stuff like that. And we can use this together with the ELF file to create an, a, a make file. And this make file um, then is used basically as a blueprint for uh, object copy and DD to basically um, cut out again stuff from the ELF file and move it with DD into the, the target firmware. So what we do is uh, each function will get its own section and therefore it's easy with object copy to uh, copy stuff out and have, a separate, have it as a separate file and then use DD later on to copy it into the firmware. So um, this is how next one works. Um, if we want to adapt this to, to our Qualcomm firmware, uh, we need to do a few steps. So what uh, next one does not support is decompression. So we need to implement this. We need to support multiple binaries. Um, this is also not supported, so the Borg confirmer just used one binary where uh, and, and just this whole binary get loaded into RAM, basically doing boot up. This is a little different for Pro, uh, Qualcomm. And also we need to support this lit base uh, option. And then uh, in the make file, it basically looks like this. If you want to compile a patch, you compile and link your patches. You copy the patches into this second part of the binary uh, I have shown earlier. Uh, into the decompressed uh, segment. You then compress it back and uh, add padding bytes and basically tidy everything up and uh, make a, a firmware file out of it, which then can be loaded into the, the Qualcomm chip. I uh, jump over the, the first step. The decompression is, is not that interesting. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's just the, in the first step you need to, to know that there is uh, compression at all, but after this um, it's pretty straightforward to implement this. What is a, a little more interesting is uh, how to handle multiple binaries. And um, as I said, we, uh, I'm using this, this uh, GCC plugin to create this additional file. And um, basically what you need to do in, in your source code is to use these kind of uh, uh, these attributes as a sort of annotation uh, for this uh, compiler plugin and what i added is basically this this option here and um, this will tell the uh, the later tools where to put this uh, um, in which segment or which part of the the second segment we need to to put this part of the, the source code so basically, we end up with this nextmon.pre file. So the first column is just uh, saying, um, in case of a patch file, okay, this is where the, the address should go. In case of a dummy, it's where the uh, this is the address of the original function. And then uh, we have some. Um, this is basically the the objects which we want to compile to. And then th here I just called um, my, pa this is basically the, the code I want to patch into. And then this is an existing function in the, in, the, um, uh, in the firmware. And I have to copy them into two different uh, subparts of this second segment. So um, after this, I, I thought, okay, I can already try to uh, create a, a small patch. So all I wanted to do is um, uh, jump into my patch uh, get a, an address and then just write one, two, three into it and jump in, into the main code. Um, what we can do is we can reuse the uh, ESP32 toolchain for GCC. So we need a, a GCC uh, uh, compiler which uh, can um, produce little endy and binaries. By default, GCC, um, for whatever reason, if you compile it for extensor support, it will only produce bit, big endian, which we cannot use in this case. Um, and after we have compiled everything, we of course we uh, want to load it in our chip. 
and uh, then I, I, I plan to uh, use the debugger base to check if this value, value did really change. But this didn't work, and um, again, the, the lit base is, is, is the problem here. So I said that uh, every load instruction, every uh, L32RR is basically using this lit base to calculate the, the offset of the, the target address. Um, so basically what it boils down to, we also need to, um, to take this into account. And this is a problem for all these load instructions here. And there is also no compiler option which uh, you can just use to uh, tell it, look, this is, uh, there is already an existing literal pool, please use this, and it, it's like already this full, that there is no such thing. So a hacky way to uh, uh, circumvent this is just uh, writing uh, assembly yourself, just ignore all the, um, uh, avoid all the, the load instructions, use immediates only, but this is of course really ugly and nobody wants to do this. So if we want to solve this, we have two options. Either we somehow manage to tell the linker where the existing literal base is and how full it is, or we uh, um, use our own literal base. Or, or, yeah. And uh, I decided to go with the second option. Uh, if you have more experience in this and think that uh, I should have rather gone with the first option, we can discuss this in the Q&A, but I thought the second option would be more portable to uh, other chips and other firmware versions. So what we need to do is basically at each entry of a, of a function, we need to uh, set our literal base to zero. And uh, at the exit of a function, we need to uh, set it back to the original value so that the rest of the firmware code can continue working. The first thing I can do relatively easy with the GCC plugin, this is just a matter of banging your head against the wall and figuring out the syntax of GCC plugins but uh, it can be done, so basically at each entry you can uh, use hooks in uh, GCC to manipulate the AST in a way uh, that you can add instructions to it. Uh, but the second uh, one is, is a problem um, because um, I, I cannot do this within GCC. The, the problem is that if you have a, a function call uh, at the end, this call will be relaxed by the assembler to a load and a call. And then again, I have a load which I, I need to, uh, to address and I, I cannot do this in GCC. So this instruction relaxation, this is what we see down here. So I just had this uh, call to the original function in my code and what, what's happening is that the uh, assembler, uh, which, which is really a, a separate binary from, from GCC, is um, translating this one call into a load and a call. And um, so I have no way of um, modifying this load within GCC. I need to do it in, um, in the assembler itself. And only after, uh, what I need to do is basically uh, set the literal base back to a, its original value after this last load instruction. So how does this relaxation work in the assembler? Uh, basically, uh, you have this sort of lookup table here, and on the left-hand side is basically the rule it, it tries to, to find. And if, if you find a, a rule which, for example, looks like this, like call eight, then it substitutes it with a load and a call. And uh, the place where this is ha happening in the, in the assembler is, is, is this function here, uh, xg build to stack, and uh, the, basically this, these instructions which we have seen here, those get translated into build instructions, and then it just iterates through these build instructions in this part of the code. And what I did is just, I'm looking for the, the current opcode, if this is a call eight, and the previous opcode, if this is a load, then I know, okay, in between here, I need to insert my new instruction, which will reset the lit base to its original value. So after all this work, we can finally <laughs> compile our patch again. Uh, now in pretty C code, um, we just need this uh, compiler plugin and um, patched assembler. So 
So this, at least the code looks much better, the tool, tooling around it, maybe not, but yeah. So this is how the, um, the, the final code looks like. So at the beginning, I read the lit base into A15. I uh, write a zero into 14 and sit, uh, set 14 to the lit base. Then uh, at the end of my code, after the last uh, load instruction, I use this uh, A15 and write it back to the lit base. This is, of course, not a good implementation because uh, I'm basically burning a, a register A15 uh, all the time, uh, two actually, here I need 14 uh, at the beginning as well. Um, so uh, a, back, a better uh, implementation would uh, use the stack uh, to store the value and then, um, so basically extend the stack a little bit, uh, save the value there, uh, which want, we want to reset at the end and then use it from the stack at the end of the function. Um, yeah, uh, as I said, still also my my patches for binary uh, ninja and uh, Chitra are not very pretty. And also, we still don't have like um, a, a nice way to debug our code. So what you really want is at least like a text console to, to get some feedback. Okay, now to a very lame demo. <laughs> I will uh, actually just show you what um, it looks like if we if we use the next one framework to compile the patch I have shown. So hopefully you can see this. Let me make it a little bigger. So this is the uh, repository um, which, uh, so this is how it looks like after you have uh, cloned it. So um, apart from a make file and a readme, it basically has three important folders. The build tools, which contain the uh, the GCC with the GCC plugin, and the uh, the assembler which I patched, and then in firmwares I store all the original firmwares, and I use also this folder to break it down into the segments and the parts, and then inside the patch folder there is basically uh, our source code we want to patch, and in in the firmwares folder as well as the patches folder. These are already prepared of, um, to uh, support multiple chips and also multiple uh, versions of uh, firmware. So the hierarchy is always like uh, chip, uh, firmware version, and then the, uh, the patch you want to compile. So if we look into, oops, into this patches folder, Oh, let me make clean. Oh, no, I need to source some environment variables first. Then I can clean it up. So this is how the, uh, the um, directory looks like out of the box. So we have a make file, which does um, all the, the compiling and um, patching the, the binary together and you have uh, some uh, link file and then the, your source code. And our source code just looks like this. So it's uh, exactly to what I've shown in the, in the slides, except for this part down here below. This we need basically as a, a jump into our patch code in the first place. So all it does is um, basically at this point in the code, we, we want to add uh, uh, four bytes to it and uh, this is what, what this macro does. So it just uh, translates uh, the, the address of, of my patch here into four bytes, which then gets substituted into the binary. And if we compile this, we see that uh, the object files are generated, the uh, wrapper files is also compiled, we generate a linker, the, the linker script, uh, more linker scripts, and then we uh, can uh, create the elf file, um, and then um, cutting stuff out from our elf file using this nextone.mk make, make file. And then after we have all our pieces, we can stitch them back together and first compress our parts again, and then uh, add everything which is also needed. So for example, we need to add some headers, the first segment, uh, and also some padding. 
So now I have uh, firmware, uh, firmware minus 5.bin, and this I can basically now use to, to run on, on uh, the router. So this is, uh, again, the, the board I brought. And uh, we can SSH into it, Nero. And we can have a look at, um, so let me see if, if the um, Wi-Fi chip is already up. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's load the, uh, uh, I think I just have it in here. So I need to, uh, oh, it's already loaded, okay. Hmm. Let me remove that again. <laughs> ADH10K PCI. And it's mod root ADH10K PCI. Okay. Let me remove the, so there are two um, kernel modules. There's a core and a, um, core and uh, the PCI driver, PCI. No, that's wrong, PCI. Mm, yeah, okay, this looks better. Maybe not. Okay, no, but it's already up. So we should be able, this kernel debug, triple E, to go into the debug FS. Yes. And then there is this mem value, which we can now use to copy out some bytes. So this is basically the address uh, which I want to write to into my patch. And, uh, okay. Yeah. So we now we can use Hextum to look into what we just copied. Okay, so this is how it basically looks before we do our patch. And now uh, let's uh, install our patch. So this just copies the firmware dot uh, minus five dot bin into the right section uh, in the Wi-Fi router and then uh, removes the PCI driver and inserts it again. Now let's give it a sec. So basically all this does is setting two bytes in the, uh, in the memory space of the Wi-Fi core and showing that the Wi-Fi core is still up and running. So this, this is all I, I could manage so far. The problem is that I spent all this time on the, um, the, the tool chain, so the, the GCC and the, um, the assembler, that I didn't have really time to uh, create a cool uh, demo. Um, I'm not sure why this is now not exiting. Let me power cycle it real quick. What I um, also have is, um, so even if we, um, if we have now a working disassembler, it's still like a lot of code and if we don't have any uh, debug interfaces, it's a, it's a lot of work to, to reverse engineer this. And I found a, um, a binary uh, on GitHub. Uh, I think it's, it was uploaded by a careless Qualcomm employee. And this binary uh, contains all the debug uh, symbols you want to have. So if you are really interested, I can uh, uh, give you the, the binary or the address where you can download it from. I don't know how we would distribute this properly without getting a DMCA takedown uh, request. So um, if you have any ideas, let me, let me know.
but uh, other, uh, if we uh, just ask me if, if you're interested. Oh, I have no idea why it doesn't answer anymore. Okay, so let's try this again. Uh, this we don't need to do. So should already have our patched code inside. So let's see, can we just set up the interface? Yes, kernel debug, I triple E, H10K. So let's look at the uh, memory dump again. Yes, so we have written successfully two whole bytes into the memory. Yeah. <laughs> That's Okay, yeah, so um, basically you can download the, this code I have shown uh, here. It includes the, as I said, the, the demo patch, uh, the, um, the patches for Chitra and Binary Ninja, and uh, a GC it already comes with a pre-compiled GCC because this is always painful to compile yourself, and also bin utils. Uh, I also provide uh, make files to compile it yourself if you want to, to, to do it. Um, so this is all in the repository. So with this, I have at least shown that this is feasible to patch. Um, I need to, to do further improvements to um, uh, finally enable security research. So we could even, uh, with this all in place, we could even implement our own debugger. Um, I also would like to look into the, this production uh, driver I mentioned earlier. To, um, this is basically using, on the host side, it's using uh, also production software, which you can get from from uh, some dubious Chinese download sites, which is called QDART. And then there's also this, this code swap feature, which is, looks really interesting and I think deserves further looking into. So um, um, I just want to thank uh, Martin Kort, uh, which is also called uh, Problem Kaput. He has some, done some awesome uh, Game Boy Advanced reverse engineering. And he even got so far of also reverse engineering the Wi-Fi chip, which is on the Game Boy Advance, which turns out to be an older Qualcomm chip. So it's an Atheros chip, which was later, later bought by Qualcomm. And also to uh, uh, to, to her, uh, our kind nibble, I guess, uh, she uh, I found her um, script which I used to unpack the, the Wi-Fi firmware. Okay, yeah, that's all from my side. If you have any questions, just raise your hand so that we can get a microphone to you. Any ideas how to distribute this, this firmware file um, which contains all the debug information? I thought about um, fine-tuning a large language model, uh, but I think this is not so easy to distribute either. No questions? Maybe one, one other remark. So um, I also try to uh, use debug interfaces on this board. So for example, JTAG. But uh, funny enough, there are uh, even dip switches in, uh, on the board to, uh, to tell you, OK, you can enable JTAG. And then there's some um, muxing done. But I, and then I, I tried to, to use OpenOCD to, uh, to get JTAG to work. But um, it didn't work at all. And um, I, I even wrote a ticket to the developer of the board and asked them, have you tried this JTAG? Does it work? How does it work? And they said, no. We, we placed it on the board, but we never tested it. I said, OK. <laughs> um, and it's also not so easy. So um, these days, these ARM chips, um, it's not so straightforward to, to enable debugging. 
Um, you basically need to have a, a really uh, uh, customized open OCD configuration file. And also, I think Qualcomm is even uh, using their own debug subsystem. No questions still? Okay, then thanks.